Hello and welcome to episode 68 of the Synergen Leadership Podcast. For those of you who are listening for the first time, my name is Julian Carl and I'm the CEO and the co-founder of Synergen Group. I'm passionate about all things leadership and management, so passionate in fact that I decided to start a podcast about it and here we are in season two and my purpose for the podcast continues to be the same, to raise the standard of leadership. In today's show, I speak with Travis Jones, who is the founder and CEO of RBT Gyms, a business with over 20 locations around Australia and overseas. He's also the co-founder and CEO of Attain Digital, which is a digital marketing agency already having great success in delivering results for their clients. He's also the founder of Think Tank, a business coaching firm specialising in working with small businesses to grow and dominate their industries. And on top of that, he's the founder of If Not Now Then When?, a not-for-profit charity foundation with a mission to establish and maintain relationships and business hubs to support entrepreneurs and other like-minded not-for-profit organisations throughout Australia. So in other words, he's doing a lot. Now, during the course of the conversation, we explore a number of different aspects of Travis's leadership journey. We start by looking back at when Travis was first in a leadership role and also the link back to his early exporting experiences. We speak a lot about feedback and how important he believes it is. We also take time to talk about where Travis shares his view that he doesn't see himself as a very good manager, he sees himself more as the visionary leader. And we finish the interview by talking about how leadership and discipline work together and how they're linked. So keep listening, and as always, we'd really love to hear your thoughts about the interview with Travis Jones, founder of RBT Gyms. Happy listening. Welcome to the Synergen Leadership Podcast with Julian Carl. Julian returns in 2019 with weekly conversations with leaders and authors from Australia and around the world, giving you the opportunity to share in their journey and learn from their expertise and knowledge. Julian also shares some of the tools and techniques he uses as a leader, mentor and facilitator, helping you to build your leadership capability and improve your confidence as a leader. Welcome, Travis, to the Synergen Leadership Podcast. Really appreciate you taking the time to be a part of it. So that the listeners have some context, can you share a little bit about uh, who you are and what you do? Yeah, mate, it's fantastic to be here. My name is Travis Jones. Um, we have a couple of companies. I guess the one that most people know is uh, Result Based Training, 21 gyms across Australia and the US, um, about 100 plus staff. Um, and then we moved into a consulting business and also a digital agency. So we sort of lead about 130 staff across the uh, three companies. And is there an interesting fact that uh, you can share with us about about the business? Interesting fact about the business is in the first year of my business, I slept on a mattress in a three by three meter room because I couldn't afford rent at a house and the lease. So that must have been a, a difficult time for you. <laughs> um, I think you just got to do what you, you what you got to do to get by in business at the start. And um, I basically had no ability to get financing to open the business. So I was sold my car and I was all chips in and uh, just moved into the gym. Cool, cool. So I'd like to take you back to your uh, the start of your leadership journey. Are you able to share with the listeners what the very first leadership role was that you had? Give a little bit of context around that. Um, Like in the in the gym, I guess the first leadership role was um, unpaid leadership. To start the business, I couldn't essentially afford staff. So what I did is I recruited four people that worked out with me and another business to work with me for free uh, for eight hours a week. So I had about thirty two hours of um, unpaid labor and they could train their own clients inside my gym. So I think that was my first type of leadership inside the RBT gyms where you're not paying people. So it's, it's trying to, hard to try, actually get them to, to lead them because you're not paying for their time sometimes. So you need to try and get them to respect the company culture um, whilst also being free employees. Yeah. And what were your biggest learnings from from that that time? Because that's a pretty interesting uh, position to be in, where you're, you've got those people there that you're not actually uh, paying and trying to really influence them. 
Yeah, it's interesting, mate. Like, I knew the guys for a while beforehand, so they had a bit of respect for me, and they also wanted to grow their own businesses. So um, it was a bit of to and fro. I, I think it was, you know, I, I'm a big fan of the whole John Maxwell Five Levels of Leadership. So I think for us, it was sometimes hard to um, have crucial conversations because it was, like, very friendship-based. And I find that hard sometimes when you are very friendly with your staff and these guys are my staff but also my mates to have those crucial conversations and to get them to go hey no you can't do that and sometimes they toe the line and and push it a little bit too far on what they should have been doing or what they could be doing um so i think that was the biggest thing for me is you know it's also understanding that you can't always be the closest of friends with those people who work with you, or at least you have to step up and have those crucial conversations when needed. And when I moved on to actually having full-time staff, paying them, it's going, oh, great, okay, we have to have these crucial conversations. We have to have feedback sessions. And in open feedback sessions every Friday we have with RBT, it gives us an environment where people are actually open to giving feedback in a non confrontational environment and people are, are just trying to better themselves to get the company to the highest potential and that's what really actually helped. And I'm always curious when uh, people make the decision or the conscious decision that they, they, they want to either stay in a leadership role or move up in a leadership role. Was it, was it during that time that you really realized that this, this idea of leadership was for you? No, I think leadership came back to the sports. I think like the best people always had, and who were leaders, always had some sort of sporting background I've found. I think leadership was like, for me, like under 15th rugby league, being a captain of a football team and, and trying to really, um, leading by pace setting, leading by, you know, going, going above and beyond for my teammates, leading by actually having those crucial conversations and sitting people out. Um, when they weren't towing the line. I think from sport you learn so much that when you can take that into the workplace, you know when you need to pay set, you know when you need to have those crucial conversations. And uh, I think, you know, without reading the leadership books or anything like that, you sort of and that we understand what it is to get the best out of people. And I think that came back from like junior sport from me. So was, was there any sort of significant uh, change before you between that role and the, I suppose the role you're in now leading, you know, 21 gyms are, are around the Australia and the US? Um, to be honest, like I'm probably one of the, I'm not a very good manager. I think um, there's different styles of managing and leading and, and leadership. For me, the whole managing with day-to-day operations and having people below me, that's not really my style. I've always sort of tried to hire managers as fast as I can and then lead people more of in a visionary state. Um, I think that's where I've sort of, um, that's where my skill levels lie. I don't like the whole, I think, you know, Jocko really talks about in the dichotomy of leadership, you know, the, the difference between free will and like micromanagement. I, I like to give more free will, but when I'm in a manager's position, I, I tend to sort of go into a bit more micromanagement. It can get frustrating with people. Um, but for me over time, I don't think my leadership style has changed too much. I think it's always just understanding that you need to appreciate people more even um, know that you think you're appreciating just can appreciate them more and making sure that you're appreciating not in just some generic way but you're appreciating them in the way that they understand and I sort of look at the five love languages for that and you know uh, I think they also wrote a book on the five length love languages of like workplace appreciation so it is the acts of service or the physical um, the actual uh, quality time or it's going uh, are bothering me on giving the, the, the gifts that they understand and it's really giving them the appreciation the way that they want to be appreciated which is such a crucial thing that's actually developed for me over the last couple of years and I think quality time is a big one and it's truly being present with your staff um, because everyone knows everyone's busy but when you are with them, it's giving them, you know, the present time where your phone, not constantly looking at your phone, but you're actually looking at them, understanding them and trying to excel and grow them. So I'm keen to explore what, what you just said there a little bit further, which was about this idea of appreciation. You, you said you've sort of really been focusing on that the, the last couple of years. How did you come to the conclusion that that was going to be a big part of how you approach leadership? 
Um, I, I think, you know, we go into business sometimes and we're a little bit selfish, you know, it's about us and, you know, we, we focus on us so much and we, we, I see a lot of people coming into it, it's like just churning through staff and when you churn through staff, then all of a sudden there's this whole learning curve you constantly have to go through um, and instead it's like if you can appreciate your staff a little bit more, if you can show them a growth with you and their company where you've mapped out their vision from there for them and it's making sure that they're feeling fulfilled every step of the way. I sort of look at them, you know, there is their own little boss inside their, um, inside their you know, ecosystem of your business. And for, for me, it's the same sort of thing. If I don't feel like I'm moving forward, if I don't feel like I'm getting the wins, I feel, fall into this void of, I guess, unfulfillment and each day becomes Groundhog Day and I don't feel like I'm moving forward and I feel like I'm just going through the motions. And I sort of reflected a couple of years ago, I was like, maybe that's, probably want my staff are feeling the same thing because we're just people at the end of the day. Um, so when I started to look at that, I was like, okay, cool. Maybe we need to have, you know, employee of the month. Maybe we need to have, um, give like just random acts of services to each other where we're giving out appreciation, not because it's a part of our KPIs or it's in our, um, you know, monthly, whatever it is, our monthly meetups, but it's just like on this Tuesday, this is what's happening. And on Thursday, someone else gets appreciated in another way. And I think the random acts of appreciation is what actually builds the bonds even stronger. And that's what we've noticed over the last couple of years. And you, you, you mentioned as well this idea that you probably see yourself more as a, a leader rather than a sort of day-to-day manager. Do you think your success in, in building the business up to sort of 21 gyms, is, is that, that that's contributed to that? Um, yeah, most definitely. Like I tried to pull out myself. Out of a, like I, I think management definitely can be learned. Um, I think I'm a very frustrating manager though, and I, I don't want to be that to my staff. And I can learn not to be a frustrating manager. But you know, I think for me, it's um, I'm I'm one of the big proponents in you know just make your strengths stronger and don't worry about your weaknesses and hire them out. So for me, I, I wanted to just stick towards my strengths and hire my weaknesses. So I think within the first year of opening my business, I pulled myself out of the management of that first location, had a great manager in, in place, and I sort of sat down with them and had our daily huddles and they managed the teams and you know, kept pulling myself up the hierarchy as we continue to scale. Um, I definitely think that would be one of the business, biggest um, strengths I had because I think as a manager, you, well, you're an operator of your business. You aren't really the, the, the owner. You, know, you kind of pull yourself out and put yourself in that 10,000 foot view. So I think the faster that people can move into that, sort of have that manager below them as they can sort of have those daily huddles. I guess sit in that CEO position and have those daily huddles and that sort of manager looks after the operations of the business on a day-to-day level, the faster the business will grow that I've seen. And can you give the the listeners a bit of a taste of what you actually do in terms of how you lead sort of 21 locations and, and what's involved in that? Um, well, because we have a couple of businesses, right? Like I'm, I sit across them, uh, a few of them, but I guess what our daily operations look like is, you know, we have a 1021 huddle where we jump on, there's a couple of regional managers um, and we're across the numbers. We look at our daily focus, how many leads, sales, cancellations, you know, what the suspensions are, what's our cash received. So that goes for about 10 minutes. Everyone says their daily focus and did they achieve their daily focus from yesterday? I'll have a one-on-one with the key leadership team once a week as well just to make sure everyone's on track with our, our 90-day projects and then I have my own 90-day projects as well right so you know I have my daily focus that I need to achieve and you know I ask whether it be sitting down across the, the new types of you know, acquisition of clients or new types of acquisition of staff and how we're doing that so I, I think the biggest thing for me is allowing for me to be in my leadership um, stance in the business right now i have my daily huddle and we have a fortnightly management meeting where we can all come together across the key aspects moving forward as a solid team and i'll have my weekly one-on-ones with our key leadership team to make sure that the rest of the projects of the company are moving forward as well and that's really my leadership style okay so we've got a bit of a bit of context now about uh 
your, the, your actual leadership function and, and sort of how you found it. I, I'm keen to explore some of your more sort of broader thoughts on, on leadership. So I want to start off with what, what do you think the biggest myth is about leadership that you've come across? Um, I think the biggest myth, I don't think everyone can be a leader. I, I really don't. I think the best leaders I've found um, have this innate ability to get the best out of people. Um, I think they are more selfless and they focus on serving their staff more than serving themselves. I think, um, you know, the whole leaders eat last that, um, I can't remember, Simon Sinek wrote, I think that is such a crucial thing. I think so many of the leaders out there are in it for themselves and they focus on what's in it for them. And I think that, you know, it comes down, I think I went back to that whole sporting sporting analogy earlier on. I think those the sporting people are the best at leadership because they, you know, from a young age, they've understood that, you know, it's the team has to come together and it's not the individual and they sort of sacrifice themselves sometimes for the team to get ahead. And when the team wins, it's, it's not because of the team, not because of them. And when the team loses, it is because of them. And it's coming into that sort of extreme ownership thing. You, you mentioned earlier about the idea that you sort of see yourself as sort of more a visionary type leader. Is, is that is that how you actively describe yourself as a leader? Is that a, is that almost a persona that you've you've developed into? Um, not necessarily. Like I think that's what a couple of my staff have said um, more so than me saying, "Hey, I'm a visionary leader." I think that would be a bit of an ego take. Uh, but for me, it's just like I am. Like it's looking at what your strengths are again at the same time, right? So you know, I've done a couple of tests and like whether it be strength finders or anything like that. And it's going, okay, what are your skills and. And what are not your skills, my skills are not follow through, my skills are not implementation, but my skills are strategy, my skills are understanding, you know, how to move the needle a bit faster and, and it's just seeing things that sometimes other people can't see. So it's like, okay, I know what my skills are. So that means I need to implement, but implement around other people inside my leadership team. And, you know, it's, they carry the ball the rest of the way down the field. You know, I can get us moving, but I'm not going to take it all the way down. And if I, if I did have ego, I'd be like, ah, I'm going to do it all. And I'd probably never, you know, kick a goal or anything like that because, you know, I'm not the person who's going to be doing that. How did it make you feel when you realized that these, these were your as you call it, your strengths, these are the things that you're really good at. Did it, was it sort of a relief almost that you're able to focus on the things that you really wanted to focus on? What, what was sort of going through your mind when you realized all this? It's, it's funny, right? I think when I realized this, I think when we start out in business, especially with like the solopreneurs or, you know, as people start out in business, they have to do it all. And then they hit this glass ceiling because they keep doing it all. And then if you reflect enough, you're like, okay, what am I actually good at? What's the 20% that's giving me the 80% of the results? And can I just focus on that? And how can I outsource the rest of the 80%? Once I started outsourcing the rest of the 80%, we started growing from, you know, the 500K to, you know, to 2 million, 3 million, up to 12 million now. Um, I started going so much faster when I started dropping my ego and said, you know what, I'm actually not good at this and find people way better than me and get them to do it instead and I'll just stick to what I'm good at. And your goal is to, you know, literally outsource yourself out of as a job as soon as you possibly can. And if you do that, your company will probably succeed. And, and how did you find the people to outsource to that were the right people? Um, I think a big thing is like a culture fit. Like one, I'll, I'll poach talent um, every day of the week. So I'll go to competitors and I'll, I'll you know, go, you know, are you feeling appreciated? Are you feeling like you have a growth plan? You know, do you want to come over to us and we'll have a growth plan um, and we'll appreciate you? Because, you know, I think that taking your competitors um, staff isn't a bad thing because they will never come to you if they were feeling appreciated or if they're feeling they were growing. So that's a big thing because sometimes you have to understand when is it a good time to hire talent or when is it a good time to grow talent or are you in the ability or the position to be able to grow talent because maybe you don't have the money to buy talent. I think that was a, a big understanding for me. Um, yeah, I, I think that was really it. And I'm always keen to know 
if there's any particular methodologies, frameworks, models that, that leaders use as they go about their business, is there any that sort of resonate with you? Um, we don't really have a framework or model as far as leadership goes. Um, you know, I think for us, as far as leadership, I think we'll talking about before is like as far as the core values, we look at a bit of a, a nine grid when we're looking at this and we have our four core values in our, you know, RBT company. And it's like we rate people three, two, one, one being high, three being low. And then we'll rate people on skill level, one, two, three, you know, one being high, three being low. And if someone's a three on the core values or a three on the skill level, well, it's time to get them out of the company as soon, fast as we can. Um, if they're or a two or a, a one on the core values, then we know we can upskill them. And it's clearly just a productivity or a skill level of competency that we need to increase. Um, if there are two on the core values, we need to let them know that there are two on the core values and you know what do they think that we need to help them with to become a one or do they not feel appreciated or do they not feel like they have a, a vision of themselves that's intertwined with the company or maybe they don't believe in the company's vision and how can we clearly articulate them for, uh, for them. And that's, that's the biggest framework. It's really based around our core values. And when we're hiring staff, if they aren't in on the core values on day one and, and they can't clearly explain to us how they would live those core values and they really can't be a part of our team. What do you think your current biggest leadership challenge is right now? I think the biggest leadership challenge at the moment for us is finding people that just have that shared vision, that, um, that tenacity, that ability to create and um, Ability to create and also transfer energy and get the keep the excitement high. Because us, I guess, when we're looking at these twenty one locations, we have these little micro cultures um, of like four or five people in each of the locations. So the leader of each of those locations needs to be that hub, that leader that keeps the the atmosphere high. And when you're looking at that, you know, they might not, I, I might not be in one of the gyms for like six months. So without, how do we transfer that energy through me to someone below me to someone below them then into a club um, when there's this transfer of energy to keep the excitement at bay? And I think that's the biggest thing that we are facing as we're at scale. And we're opening up, we open up, you know, six new locations last year, we're opening up another six to eight this year. So when we're looking at this, you know, you're, you're constantly finding a new staff member once every probably like three days. So it's bringing them and clearly getting them on board with the plan and the vision and the mission and making sure that they can really feel it. And I think that's, that's one of the biggest um, hurdles or obstacles we're facing. That, that seems like some pretty significant growth in terms of locations each year. How are you finding sort of dealing with that side of the business, just this continual growth? Um, I think for us, like, yeah, like, I guess hiring is probably one of the biggest things. Uh, it's looking at, do we start our own RTO agency where we're manufacturing our own next wave of uh, staff ourselves, where we're, where we're teaching, educating personal trainers um, and then bring them up through the ranks. I think that's one of the things that we've crossed across ourselves with. We started an internship program, um, which is bringing people in from, you know, doing their certifications and educating them further and then pulling people who are the best in the core value sense into our locations and taking them from there. That's, that is honestly one of the biggest things. Like we're in such a competitive landscape and um, for us, it's keeping the ability for us to keep growing with great quality staff is probably one of the hardest things that we can find right now. So, you know, that, that is our obstacle and that's why we're trying to manufacture our next wave or next line of new employees through our, our um, you know, marketing for our internship programs and creating our own, um, you know, essentially certifications to bring people into our business. So I'm, I'm keen to explore what what you would describe as your area of leadership passion what is it about being in a leadership role that that most excites you that you get that that's the thing which really drives you I love communicating with staff and opening up their eyes to something or if they're playing at about 80 or 90 percent just helping them understand what it's like to move to the hundreds or 110 percent really go wow you see this light bulb moment go off in their head and they're like, 
that's it. Like you can just all of a sudden you've you've just leveled them up as a human being uh, for them to play life that that little bit better, that little bit harder, that little bit faster, and all of a sudden that they've come to the next evolution of themselves. And by transferring the energy, by transferring skill levels, by giving them this uh, being, being around an environment where they can excel at, like that's truly what I, I love to see. I, I, I always try and go into every conversation with any staff member, hoping that they leave a conversation with me going, wow, I, I loved having that conversation. I feel like I'm a better off as a human being for having it whether that be a crucial conversation or whether that be just a, a conversation about nothing. I want them to leave that conversation feeling better because we had it. And, you know, they understand that every single conversation they have with a member of ours could change that member's life, whether they came in in a negative state and they lifted that person's, you know, energy up into a positive state, that, that state could change their day and that day could change their life. So our staff are truly empowered to understand that a smile, a high five, uh, and, you know, a word said the right way could dictate someone a brand new avenue for the rest of their life. And I think that's what I love about leadership. So in the programs we run, uh, one of the things that our clients come to us about is that they're always looking to improve the communication that uh, happens within their businesses. And quite often they find that a challenge because they've got multiple locations do you have a do you have a structured approach? Do you have a very informal approach? Do you sort of run both formal and informal approaches? Um, I think for us, like one of the biggest things is yeah, we have we have structure and informal and informal. We have the ability for them to submit feedback at any time through like an internal network. We have feedback Fridays inside our um, business where you know the individual locations sit down and get and you know essentially give feedback on a one-to-one level on how they can all increase themselves as a team. We have our managers, we have a 30 minutes to strive meeting every single Monday that I run with every single manager across the company. And we sort of roll out the week and, and make sure we're on track for the monthly focus. And we also invite feedback then in a, a group scenario. Um, we have our regional meetings, which are essentially grouped um, on an education basis, whether it be the new technology we're rolling out and that happens every fortnight so we have you know i guess feedback and education rollouts and um inside that arena as well um so i I guess we we have feedback on a micro level we have feedback on a person to person level and we sort of do it as a company level once a week as well so it is manufactured in a way and then we also do it um as far as an employee of the month um where you know they can they submit you know, someone that they work with and we give a thousand dollars away every single month to our employee of the month. So what happens with that is, you know, we'll have, you know, 15, 20, 25 submissions every single month from our staff around the world where it's like, you know, Joe, live the core values by doing this. And they give this like, very clear explanation on how these core values were lived, whether they went above and beyond and, you know, went down to one of our clients who was a hospital and they like, brought them food or, you know, maybe they took someone shopping for food because they, they didn't know what to do. Um, but, you know, they've clearly outlined how this employee went above and beyond and we give them a significance and I guess the – you know, appreciation across in front of the whole company and they get a financial award as well. So I guess, again, that is, is one of the things that we do as well. You seem to have a very strong sense of the requirement to have a, a strong set of corporate and company values, which in my experience can be quite unusual for sort of small to medium businesses. How, how did you come to that conclusion that that was going to be a central part of how you're going to approach the business and your leadership? Um, like I think, you know, it comes down to, everything comes down to a bit of gut. And, um, when we didn't have the core values to start with, uh, I felt like it was hard to have those crucial conversations because it's like, you're falling out of line because of this. And they're like, well, I didn't even know I was supposed to, you know, go above and beyond. I didn't even know I was supposed to inspire or I didn't know we were result driven. And for us, with our core values, we have like four or five explanations on what it would look like to live within the core values and then without the core values. And I, I find that it's so easy 
to now live in a black or white world with our staff because they know what is right and they know what is wrong. And beforehand, it was grey. And it's very hard to manage someone in a, in a grey environment. Um, when it's black or white, you can let people know when they're winning and let people know when they're losing. And as human beings, we love to win. So for us, you know, and we're leading our teams, they understand how they can be a winner every single day. And when people wake up and they win, then the whole team wins. Do you find that the, the staff that with you leading the values from such a strong perspective that the staff really started to embrace those values as well? Yeah, 100%. I think like there's a time for pace setting and um, there's a time where you don't, but I think, you know, you have to always pace set the values. Um, you know, they have to understand that, yeah, you are um, the, the, the leader or the company leader must live those values. You know, for us, they are, yeah, they're community driven or inspire or result driven or educate and empower. So for me, that I have to be the one that lives those values the very strongest. If not, like, you know, the, the values are, are worth nothing. Yeah, I think I think it's important because a lot of large organisations don't do the living and breathing of their values very well. They're very good at putting them up on a wall and saying these are our corporate values, but when it comes to actually living them and breathing them and getting them instilled throughout the entire organisation, I think a lot of really large corporates really struggle with it. Yeah, I, I completely agree with you. All of a sudden, these values are somewhere they they saw on a website somewhere, and now they're up on a wall, and people don't even like. I believe the values need to evoke emotion and like they have to, like, it's not just a word, it's a feeling. And it's like, okay, I know what it's like to live this value. And I know a circumstance on where I could be within the values or not within the values. And, you know, these, they are just words, but that's how the, the, like, essentially, like we said before, like the ecosystem survives. And if you aren't living these values, you know, you'll slowly die as a business. And I think, you know, our teams understand that, you know, we can always increase the competency, the skill levels um, of them to make them the best or world best in the world or what they do. But these core values, like that's who you are as a person. And like we can't change who you are as a person. So for us, for our core values, like that's where we focus most on because, you know, we're hiring a a set of people who live and breathe something um, and they're like-minded and they're in this thing together and, you know, that's what they love. So what does the, the future hold for you? Are there any particular goals that you're trying to achieve? Yeah, for the next, over the next couple of years, we'll probably scale past 21 to 50 locations over the next, I would say, two and a half, three years um, in Australia. Uh, and that's one of the biggest goals for me um, is to get to those 50 locations in Australia um, after that, we'll probably sort of sit and go, you know, do we fully want to go into the States or, or do we not? I'm not 100% sure on that yet, but I think the biggest goal over the next three years is 50 locations in Australia as a as one company. Um, and the digital agency, you know, we're, we're always going to stay as a boutique agency. That's not going to, you know, grow too much. And, you know, for us as our consulting company, we consult to about, you know, 70, 80 businesses at the moment. We'll grow to about 200 businesses um, over the next year. So how did, you, how did you come to that goal? What made you want to hit that, that 50 locations for the gyms and then the 80 to 200 with your consulting business? Um, well, for us, like what I wanted to look at is um, the gyms, it's 10,000 members. You know, our average gym does 200 members. We're a micro gym with a higher fee. So it costs about 77 to $87 a, a week to uh, come to one of my gyms. So with this, it means we get to impact 10,000 lives. And that's our, that's our BHAG. We want to impact 10,000 lives and say, RBT changed my life because I want 10,000 of those every single year. And to do that, I need 50 gyms. Um, as far as the, the micro gyms, uh, as far as the other businesses that I want to consult to, well, for me, my, my goal this year is 200 businesses increasing their revenue by $300,000. And that's my $60 million goal for our consulting company this year. Um, I, I picked the number and I was like, oh, yeah, I think, I, I think we can do that. We can increase uh, $60 million into small businesses uh, across Australia and the UK. And that's where the, the space that we play in and, and that's what we're working towards is a revenue increase of 300000 by 
uh, 200 businesses this year. How do you continue your development as a leader? It's interesting. I find the best stuff that um, I get is I'm always in a couple of different masterminds and, you know, your, your environment is, is crucial, right? You are the sum of the five people and I do believe that. Um, but I, I read a book a week, every single week. It's making sure that my morning routine is on point and making sure I, I give myself that 30 to 60 minutes to read every single day. And, you know, I was probably the worst of this growing up. And, you know, since I started my business and I continue to grow, like, you know, I try and get through a good 50 plus books a year, but not just reading knowledge. It's actually, you know, taking the book, it's understanding what's inside the book, it's writing the notes around the book and seeing how can I implement that book into my life, my business. And I think that's one of the biggest um, avenues of education for me is a, is a ten dollar book each week that I buy. Yeah. So, what's your favourite book uh, at the moment? Um, I would say my favourite book of all time is Viktor Frankl's *A Man's Search for Meaning*. Uh, I think that was such a, a powerful book for me. So, what challenges do you think uh, your industry sector is going to face, and how are you going to deal with them? Yeah, like it's an interesting one, right? We are uh, in the rise of the franchises right now. You know, yeah. I, I think yeah, there is there is so many out there. And like for us, it's looking at it because we're, we're one company, um, you know, and you know, so many of these franchises that are getting sold, whether it be the B-Fits, the F45s, the, there's the Core 9s, the Round 12s, and then there's the 24-hour gyms. I think the 24-hour gyms have their own, um, problems coming towards them, the snaps, the jets. Like when we look at the States, and I think everything flows across from the States, when we compete on price, we lose on price. And that's a big thing coming towards the 24-hour marketplace because, you know, they kept going down over the last 20 years, down on their monthly on their monthly uh, charges. And I think they're seeing around $10 a month for the, the 24-hour gyms in the States right now. And even some of them, they do like pizza Thursdays where there's free pizza for their their members on Thursdays and they figure by giving pizza out that they are giving their members enough dollar value for money by them feeding them pizza so they don't actually cancel their membership. Um, and they're just competing. It's pretty crazy. They're just competing on price. Now, the micro gyms or the, the franchises um, you know, that's, and that uh, competing on price will come into Australia. The margins will get less and less. You'll see the people closing down as like, you know, Fitness First closed all their South Australian and West Australian clubs already. They've closed a bunch over the last couple of years and that will continue to happen. Um, but when we're looking at the, the rise of these micro gyms or these franchises, um, like what happens is this is normally like a mum and pop kind of business. And you saw this with a lot of the CrossFits. They, they get their first lease. Um, 96% of businesses fail, right? Like, so they get their first lease, they, they get sold the dream by the franchise and they're working harder than they've ever worked. They're working like 16, 17, 18 hours a day. And by the end of that first five years, when they have the option to renew their lease, they're like, you know what, this is not for me. I cannot work this hard. For this little return, I'm going to go back to wherever I was working beforehand. So... I think for us that whilst there's a rise in these franchises coming up, there's also the previous franchises that came out like four or five years ago, there's a rise in the sale of those franchises right now. You see a lot of record 45s already being sold because it's just like they're just not the right person. They might be a great employee, but then they're a great business owner. Um, so just because somebody's a great technician doesn't mean they're great at running a business. And I think that's what we'll face. Um, that there'll be a lot of people, there'll be a rise and a saturation in the marketplace and there'll be a collapse of the marketplace over the next sort of four or five years as well with a lot of these locations. Um, I guess the next thing we'll probably face in the next six to seven years is there'll be some pill that people take and um, that gets them fit and, and gets them to have apps. And I think that's the next thing. Um, you know, we're always going against technology, but I think the pill will come out and, you know, people will start taking the pill and, and like, that's probably the next thing that we'll have to battle. That's probably like six or seven years away. You, you made a very conscious decision. You said before about, uh, your price point that, uh, you're certainly not pitched at that sort of bottom end of the market. How are people responding to that when you talk to them about why you're positioned the way you are in terms of pricing? Well, I think you compete on price or you compete on experience. 
Um, you know, if you compete on price, then you'll lose on price and people will always, the loyalty isn't there. And they always go to the clo- next person closer to them or the next person cheaper. Uh, but when you compete on experience, like I think that increases brand loyalty. I think people, when they, they can't find a similar experience to you, then they can't compare apples to apples. Like you're a banana, you're an orange. They, they really can't find anything out there like you. So it's trying to go, okay, what is the experience that I'm trying to create and how can I manufacture this experience that I can spread it out across multiple locations as I'm trying to scale so that I can manufacture this experience, this atmosphere that makes people love it um, at scale. And are there any leaders that uh, you either look up to or that uh, inspire you? Um, like, I, I guess, uh, you know, it's funny, like the whole R- Richard Branson thing, I, I think, you know, he, he is a fantastic leader, but I've never had, had a conversation with him. So I'm not sure what he's like as a, a one-on-one basis. You know, like, again, Simon Sinek, I think he's a fantastic leader in his own right and understanding, you know, being selfless and putting up the spurs. And, you know, I, I love that. I like, you know, Robin Sharma. You know, he, you know, the whole a leader with no title. I was, you know, uh, lucky enough to be in a mastermind for a while with Robin Sharma. And, you know, I, I believe that everyone can embody that. It doesn't matter who they are. They are a leader of their role. And I, and I love that as well. And then, you know, Jocko Willink, I, I love the fact that the whole extreme ownership style of leadership, you know, that's, you know, if someone below you does something wrong, it's probably your fault because you didn't, you know, communicate clearly enough. You didn't, you know, hold them accountable enough or, you know, you gave them free will too early. Um, I think those are the biggest uh, people and John Maxwell. I think John Maxwell most definitely like, you know, the frameworks that he has around leadership that are so easy to understand. Um, I think those like four or five people uh, are some of the biggest people that I've got the most from over the years. And so where can people find out more about you and uh, what you do? Um, to be honest, probably the biggest place you can find me is on Instagram at the moment. I, I started doing this Instagram thing. I can't do multiple platforms. Like I sort of um, went into Instagram about a year ago and, you know, that's where you find me. I do sort of education um, through business twice a day, every day on Instagram. I'll do Q&A sections and lives through there. So it's Travis Jones Entrepreneur on Instagram and that's probably the best way to find me. Yeah. It's interesting you say that because uh, it's interesting when people uh, that with their social platforms, uh, I'm hearing quite a few people start to talk about Instagram now as being sort of the way to connect with the, the, their audience and the people that want to work with them. Yeah, like I get people reaching out to me every single day. I think that the, like I, I personally don't manage my LinkedIn. I have someone else that does manage my LinkedIn. Um, but like for me, like on Instagram, I think what people love is there is a place in the feed where you can educate, but I think people want also want to connect with you, like the real you. So in the stories, they get to say, well, like what, what do they like on a daily, on their life? Like what do they like as a person behind the scenes? And I think there's this voyeuristic shift that's happened in the world, obviously with reality TV and now it's the state of Instagram, but everyone wants to understand like, what happens behind the scenes, it's not for everyone, but the people who are using it and leveraging it, they're truly um, they're, they're getting like exponential growth with their brand and their business um, because, you know, they're just leaning into it. Yeah. So any last words on leadership, Travis, you'd like to share with the listeners? I, I think for everyone who is listening with the leadership, I think um, – that you know, leadership over t- is just created over time. It's you know, I would try and get as many books as you can under your belt. Um, understand that you know, leading your s- leadership starts with leading yourself. Leadership starts with like doing what you said you would do. Leadership starts with discipline. And if you want disciplined, you know, to if you press the the um, the, the alarm to wake up at 5 a.m. and you didn't, you press snooze, well, that's poor leadership. And how you do anything is how you do everything. And that will reflect in how you communicate, will reflect in how you turn up to meetings, or reflect in you know, how you look when you look at yourself in the mirror. So I would say that leadership starts with leading yourself correctly. All right. Well, uh, on that note, Travis, thank you so much for being a part of the Synergy Leadership Podcast. All the best. 
Thank you so much. Well, that wraps up episode 68 of the Synergen Leadership Podcast, another great business leader ep- interview for you. I'd like to encourage you to head on over to the Synergen Group website and engage in the conversation with us. Tell us what you liked about the episode, tell us who you'd like me to interview, or tell us what sort of content you'd like us to deliver. And if you are an iPhone user, please feel free to head on over to the Apple site, leave us a review, it does help us build awareness of the podcast. In next week's episode, we have our first member of the Synergen Two Times Club as I welcome back to the podcast, Toby Hall, who is the group CEO of St. Vincent's Health Australia. And in this episode, we discuss all things purpose. So it's another great episode. Until then, love to hear what you think. Happy listening.